Hello and welcome to another episode of Podcast DX, the show that brings you interviews with people just like you, whose lives were forever changed by a medical diagnosis. I'm Lita. And I'm Ron. And I'm Jean Marie. Collectively, we're the hosts of Podcast DX. Our guest today is Karen Warzek. She's a wife and mother of five children. Her youngest, who is now 13, was born seemingly healthy. In her first weeks, it became clear that she wasn't developing normally. After 10 years of looking for a diagnosis and not finding answers, they decided to do whole exome sequencing. That finally gave them an answer. She has a mutation of her CAMK2 gene. It was so newly discovered that only a handful of people were diagnosed with this. Since it has been discovered, more children are being found to be in the family of CAMK2 mutations. It is so new that they are just beginning studying this in humans, and there isn't a formal quote-unquote syndrome name of it as yet. Hi, Karen. Hello. Good morning, Karen, and thank you for taking the time to uh, join us today. Um, please, please start us out by telling our listeners what exactly is this CAMK2? Okay, so um, uh, for short, we'll call it CAMK2, and okay. we all have this gene. We have actually, there's a family of four, um, CAMK2A, which is alpha, and then there's beta, uh, delta, and gamma. And so basically what this gene does is it is responsible for transferring calcium between cells. And I'm sorry, I'm not, it's way more complex than that, And but that's basically what it does. And um, so, you know, genes are made up of proteins. And in my daughter's case, on her CAMK2B gene along the way, there was a protein that was misspelled is what they call it a misspelling so one protein was transferred out and another protein was put in its place and it's the wrong one and it causes the cells or the genes to act abnormally which means that um, it sends the wrong message and her body doesn't function normally so back when she was first diagnosed i say as back then three years ago there were probably 10 people known. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, but it was just discovered. So <laughs> in the past, there probably have been a ton of people mm -hmm. with this disorder, and now that they can identify it, more coming forward. So it generally, um, it causes intellectual disabilities, causes epilepsy in some. Some kids have GI issues. Uh, some are tube-fed. Some have motor delays. Some walk, others don't. My daughter is non-ambulatory. Um, she does get around. She's very resourceful. She she log rolls around the house and uh, can squeeze to get through doorways even. So she's a very smart girl. She knows she knows what to do. Um, a lot of kids have self-harming behaviors, mm -hmm. autistic features. Yeah, and uh, so specifically my daughter, she didn't sit up until her first birthday. I noticed seizures right from the start. I brought it up at her six-week checkup. And her doctor said, no, no, no. She's just, she called it pseudo-seizures mm -hmm. because of, of GERD. And it turns out she did have some reflux, um, but nobody was believing me that she was having seizures. So I spent a ton of time on the Internet trying to describe these seizures, which I thought them to be temporal lobe seizures. And it went, she was five months old before she had such a pronounced seizure that somebody finally believed us. And she had her first EEG then. Um, she didn't meet her milestones, um, never looked me in the eye, never smiled. When I brought this up early on, my OBGYN, so because of that, I thought she wasn't bonding with me. My OBGYN said, oh, you have postpartum depression. This, this can't be. And so they 
pretty much tried to make me think I was just imagining everything. But she's the youngest of five. Right, um, you have a I've lot of experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've had four typical kids before her, and I just knew something was not right. Mm -hmm. So we went through 10 years of she CTs, MRIs, two rounds of genetic testing, uh, mitochondrial, she had a, a muscle biopsy, and everything was, was negative. So we decided to stop putting her through all this because it was just too much and, and we weren't getting answers. And one day a neurologist said to me, you know, she may not have a known syndrome, but she has her own syndrome and mm -hmm. you should really get the whole exome testing done just, just to see. And so we were like, okay. And it took about six weeks to get the results. And I was really not expecting anything. And then I said, oh, yeah, this Cam K2 thing. And I was like, oh. And I went home, jumped on Facebook, mm -hmm. searched for it. And there's a little family of Cam K2 people oh. out there. So we've, uh, we've been family ever since. Sure, oh. sure. Wow. Mm -hmm. Sorry that you had to go through all of that to kind of find out what was going on. Um, what about... Uh, I mean, do you know, or how do you find out um, about this genetic mutation? How does someone get it? It is what they call a de novo mutation. So it just randomly happened um, early in her first weeks of development. So we were both, all of us were tested, and my husband and myself don't have any genes that would, we wouldn't be a carrier. Could it be recessive? I can't really speak too much about that. I do know that in our group, at least one of the parents is a carrier oh. and have passed it on. But I don't really know much about that. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Karen. Uh, I think our listeners will have a better understanding of what we're going to be talking about because... When you just talk about a bunch of initials, you know, what is that? Yeah. And especially since it's mm -hmm. so rare, t horribly rare, yeah. uh, you know, no one would have any idea. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. And Karen, um, you, you mentioned that it affects your daughter's ambulation and motor function. Um, have you seen um, how it affects her differently as she progresses in age? And is she, she's now 10 years old? She's 13. 13 years old. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, so she has intellectual disability. She, she's nonverbal. Mm -hmm. um, we have, as of yet, to find communication that works for her. So pretty much we've stuck to a routine all of her life. Um, she's trained us pretty much. We uh -huh. know right. what she wants and... And I can tell by her vocalizations, um, if she's hungry, if she's bored. Um, so, yeah, she's the boss around here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she also has GI issues. She has the reflux. And she has dysphagia, which means she cannot swallow properly. Um, mm -hmm. So we have to puree all of her food mm -hmm. because she doesn't chew. She mashes food in her mouth. Um, and then we have to thicken her liquids mm -hmm. um, because she aspirates if we don't. Mm -hmm. um, as she's growing, because of her low muscle tone, um, she's starting to develop a little bit of neuromuscular scoliosis. Um, she has, of course, decreased bone density because she doesn't stand regularly. So she doesn't get, those bones don't get... Um, you know, the weight bearing that it needs to develop bone. Mm -hmm. um, she does have self-harming behaviors. And that's changed over the years as well. And I think it's because she's kind of growing into herself a little more. She's more comfortable in her own skin. But when she was a baby, she would cry. Her first three years with her, she cried constantly. And she didn't sleep. Um, she would go for days and days at a time where she just would not sleep. Um, and she would throw her head back and nail you in the chest or nail mm. you in the face. And that was pretty tough. And now when she's frustrated or surprised, she bites herself. 
and she bites one spot on her arm, on her right arm, at so hard that I don't think she can feel pain, honestly. Oh, she can break the wow. skin. Oh. Yeah. So we have a little brace for the, the periods when we go through that. Um, and then the most concerning thing for me and that I haven't seen so much in the other kids that I know is that she has these cycles of weakness. She would regress um, back when she was, it started when she was about three. Um, she would lose all of her muscle tone. Like she would go floppy like a newborn. I remember feeding her and her head just bobbed forward and hit the tray of her, her high mm. chair. It's how weak she was. Um, she lost her ability to eat without choking and she would sleep constantly. And uh, our first time we experienced this, she had muscle conduction studies, she had scans, she had EEG. It never showed anything. And this would cycle every uh, three to five week, months, sorry. Um, and then as she got older, those periods started becoming more and more far apart. So we went a year and a half, I think, one time without anything like that. Um, lately, she's going back into cycling around, but it's presenting differently. She's um, just sleeping constantly. She, she doesn't lose her muscle tone. She wakes up, she eats. That's important for her. She's food motivated and um, she'll sleep and she'll do this for a week or two at a time and she'll come out of it and be okay for a couple of weeks and then do it all again. Mm. And the doctors don't really know what to make of it. They say it's her way of fighting a virus, but it's way too cyclical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I brought that up with um, a doctor uh, who's in Rotterdam, and we'll get more into that in a little bit, um, who was doing like a, a question and answer for the parents. And she agreed with me that, yeah, it sounds more like whatever's going on at a cellular <clears throat> level with her um, more than anything else. Mm -hmm. So what else? The seizures. Um, so from birth to three years old, she was having them. And then they stopped. And we took her off the seizure meds, and she's been great for 10 years. And then last September, she started having seizures again, but they're different in presentation. They're, instead of just spacing out, uh, it's more like a, a grand mal. Mm. And it was only, only happening at night after she fell asleep. And just every 26, 27, 28 days, which makes me wonder now if uh, Hormonal, hormones right? are coming in. Right. Hormones are right. coming into play right. and um, it's affecting her. Yeah. So, but she's doing well. She's on back on medication and it seems to be working. So, but that's just the life in her, in her 13 years. <laughs> well, I have two questions. Um, so what is her favorite yeah. food? <laughs> her favorite food? Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, she will eat anything. I just, last night we had pizza okay. and I ordered a large pizza mm -hmm. and we have to grind, have to grind it up for, she ate almost half a large pizza. And this child is tiny. She is all of 68 pounds. Oh, wow. And just skinny as a rail. And I don't know how she can eat the way she does. And she, she loves munchkins. Um, <laughs> What's a munchkin? Ice cream sandwiches. Okay. <laughs> I think she means Dunkin' yeah. Munchkin. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Dunkin' yeah. Munchkin. Yeah. Okay, sorry. sorry. Who oh, doesn't? yeah, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Who doesn't it, love it, Dunkin' Munchkins? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ice cream sandwiches, <laughs> okay. Um, and she pretty much eats whatever whatever I make. I'm a, I'm a big cook, and I usually don't make the same thing twice, and she's happy. She happily eats it. She does have some food allergies. We found that out the hard way. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, it, it's hard when you have a nonverbal child, right. and of course, uh, we sit down to eat, and she can't say, "My throat feels funny," or, mm -hmm. you know, "I'm I'm itchy." So we have to wait for the uh, symptoms to actually present themselves, and that was pretty scary. But we found out she's allergic to uh, salmon. Oh, okay. Um, 
and so seafood allergies, nut allergies. Right. Okay. But other than that, she she will eat anything you give her. Hmm. Well, we're from Chicago, so we can understand her. You know, her loving pizza. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Seth, we're from New York, so we like oh, oh they had their own pizza. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, those are fighting words. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What was your other question? Oh, oh, and my other question was: um Is gene therapy a possibility for kids with? Not yet. Okay. Okay. Yeah, not yet. We okay. they have to understand the gene more, and they're sure. just it's so pretty much they know how it affects mice, but now they need to know exactly what it does with our kids. Okay. Well, Karen, can you tell us uh, how common, I guess, this CAMK2 is? And I don't know, this is probably a silly question, but have you ever even heard of this prior to your daughter being born? Uh, no, nope, never heard of it before. And I would say it's growing. Um, so it's probably more common than we think. But back... Back then, there was just a handful. Um, now, I think they're up to maybe, well, last spring, it was like 70 known cases. And it's probably up to 100 now. But still, considering very the small. whole wide world. Oh, absolutely. Right. Very pretty small. absolutely. Yeah, and I guess a rare condition is under 200,000. So, I mean, this is very rare. Very rare. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and what other treatments... Um, are on the horizon for this particular condition? So um, there's a place in Rotterdam, Netherlands, Van Worden Labs. Um, they just are beginning to, well, it's been a couple of years now, uh, take interest in taking a look at our kids. They just held uh, the second Cam K2 conference this past spring. And so because it's in another country, they're trying to um, uh, communicate with our doctors in this country to see how testing can be, be done. Um, there are kids from all over the world. So there are kids uh, closer that have actually been started or have started the testing. So hopefully with the research just beginning, um, there'll be something in the near future or for future generations. It's, it's hard. Uh, being a caregiver mm -hmm. is a tough role. Uh, Karen, what role mm -hmm. does self-care play in your everyday life? Because you've, you've had a rough 13 years here. <laughs> uh, I would like to say I have really great self-care behaviors. But I was a mom of five, and I work full time, so it's really hard to get time for myself. Mm -hmm. um, I like to try to take a day on the weekend to, and my husband's really great about getting up with her and letting me sleep in and kind of rejuvenate. Um, and he's a big fisherman, so every couple of weeks he tries to get out on the ice and and have a little him time mm -hmm. so i wish um i could get back uh in a bubble bath a couple of nights a week but sometimes it doesn't work out sure, sure. <laughs> and what role have your family and friends played in the healthcare journey with your daughter my in-laws have been saints um they have stepped in both my mother and father-in-law and my brother-in-law um, to take care of her while my husband and I do something for ourselves. Um, she has a caregiver who has become a friend over the years. She was her one-to-one -one aide in preschool. Mm -hmm. And then when she aged out of preschool, um, she started to take her every day after school. So she's been a godsend. Our circle is really small. And sometimes, you've probably heard it before, um, the friends that you've had when you have a child with special needs, they kind of distance themselves sometimes. Mm -hmm. And that's been our experience. Right. That's a shame. But uh, it, it, it is, is difficult, I think, for some people to 
to well, have the empathy and to... Well, if that's not part of their life, they don't know it. It's and, hard for yeah, them to understand yeah. the we the intensity of it. We run into that a lot, mm-hmm. absolutely. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, I probably come across to them as very um, non-committal. Uh, I remember years ago, it, it was winter time, and somebody asked me to go to the mall. And I thought, oh, my gosh, I'll have to pack her up. I'll have to put her wheelchair together, stick it in the car. It's snowing. And it'll be lunchtime, and I don't have any way to grind her food in a mall. And my friend just couldn't understand all that. She was very offended that that I wouldn't go. Hmm. But those are the kind of internal battles I have Mm -hmm. as a mom of a kid with special needs. Okay. It sounds like they need a handbook to pass out to friends and family when, you know, when someone's well, co- trying to cope with a chronic illness or a lifelong condition, you know, you need to, um, so that people can see what thing, what life is like from another perspective. Well, it's empathy. And, yeah. and if you don't experience it, you don't really know it. Right. Right. And friendship is mm-hmm. work. And sometimes mm-hmm. it, you know, the other person has yeah. to put in more yeah. effort. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear yeah. that, but I'm I'm really happy to hear that you do have a tight um, network Circle. of very supportive people mm-hmm. right. in sure. your life. Mm-hmm. It's wonderful, and mm-hmm. I wish you could get another bubble bath in there. Every week. <laughs> yes. yeah. Thanks. Yeah, because I have to say that you know it sounds like you've been an amazing advocate for your daughter, and um, you know if if all children had were so lucky, it would be a whole different world. Mm-hmm. And Karen, what's the best advice you've received? for um, have, you know, living with a child with a rare disease? And what advice do you have for someone whose child's been recently diagnosed with a rare condition? Um, the best advice I was given is to basically don't forget about myself and to take care of myself so that I can take care of her. And the advice I'd give somebody else is be an advocate. Don't don't take no for an answer um, if you you know your child best. So um, keep looking. I mean, we almost quit. We, we weren't going to put her through another test. But I'm glad we did because now we have that additional support system. And we can hopefully help and contribute to future families whose child has been diagnosed with a cam k2 mutation that's good yeah that's good advice. Yeah. karen how can our listeners learn more about you and the cam k2 um and do you have any social media links um that you want to share with us we a couple of the parents are putting together a foundation they're looking at all the legalities involved with that Um, So we have a very um, basic page right now. It's KimK2, the number two, dot org. Um, From there, it has a link to their Facebook page. And there's also an email if your child has been diagnosed with a KimK2 disorder. And that's info at KimK2. Org. Okay, great. Well, Thank we will you. definitely yes. include those links on our website as well. Uh, Karen, thank you very much. Um, before we end, is there anything else that you wanted to share with our listeners? No, I feel like I rambled. A lot. No, no, you did not at all. You did fine. Not at all. Not at all. No, you did fine. Right. It was excellent. Uh, well, thank you very much, Karen, for joining us today. And we look forward to uh, uh Posting this episode? Posting, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what happened Well, with and my getting script. this information out because, um, you know, I, I can't even imagine, you know, I mean, with everything you've been through, you've really set the foundation for future for future um, parents. And, and that's just. Yeah. What, you know what amazing. came to mind when I was listening about listening to this is what about parents in, let's say, a I, I hate the, the no, term. Yeah, in, in an area where in an area genetic that testing isn't, isn't available. Right, right, right. What would they do? How would right, they? Right. Per, they just have to go by their gut, right. which is what you be what you did in the beginning, and realize mm-hmm. that there's something off, and pursue the doctors until something is found in order to help their child. Yeah. 
Yeah, and in our case, we're not in a, a highly populated area. So what we had to do was um, have the testing mailed out to another state. I think it was California. Um, wow. But the ca capabilities there, if you have a neurologist or a geneticist that works with you, um, they can make it happen. Um, I know funding is, is a problem for especially people in, in other countries. Um, but it usually can be worked out. It's worth the yeah. try. It's, it's worth every effort. It, it absolutely is. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> um, we really appreciate you coming on the show this morning and sharing the, uh, well, your story with us. I'm sure that we have, and I'm sure our listeners learned a lot about this episode. Yes, thank you, Karen. I mean, with five kids, a full-time job, I, I can't even imagine. Uh, this. Your time is very precious, and we appreciate you spending it with us this morning. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Yeah, it's our pleasure. If our listeners have any questions or comments related to today's show, they can contact us at podcastdx at yahoo.com, through our website, podcastdx.com, on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, or Instagram. And if you have a moment to spare, please give us a review wherever you get your podcast. As always, please keep in mind that this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health care provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition and, or treatment and before undertaking a new health care regime. And never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you've heard on this podcast. Till next week. Oh, 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 oh.